got some people trickling in, but we'll get started. Um, on behalf of the MDTC Insurance Law Section, we're proud to present today's webinar uh, presented by Joseph Neal of Explico, uh, Heavy Vehicle Collision Investigation and Reconstruction. Uh, before we begin, we want to give a special thank you to some of our sponsors, um, LCS Record Retrieval, and Kitch Attorneys and Counselors, and especially Ex Explico for putting on today's webinar. Uh, we also want to remind you of a few events coming up that you can see on the screen here. Uh, the first is our summer conference on June 15 to 16 uh, at Treetops in Gaylord. It's an excellent opportunity to let loose, golf, and learn a few things while you're at it. Um, feel free to sign up for that. And also our Battle of the Bar softball game, which is on August 11, 2023, at the Corner Ballpark in Detroit. If you'd like to sign up for that, uh, feel free to contact support at mdtc.org. Um, and finally, we want to thank all of our firms and leadership, which are shown here. If you'd like to get involved in the leadership, um, contact Madeline at the email listed there at info at mdtc.org. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Joseph Neal from Explico. Mr. Neal is a, quali a highly qualified forensic engineer. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering and is a licensed professional engineer with over 12 years of experience in collision, reconstruction, mechanical failure analysis, and forensics. Mr. Neal has worked on a wide range of projects, including passenger vehicle collisions, heavy vehicle collision reconstruction, motorcycle, bicycle, pedestrian incidents, traffic signal operation, construction zone maintenance of traffic, as well as heavy machinery and industrial accidents. During this webinar, Mr. Neal will be sharing his knowledge and experience in heavy vehicle collision investigation and reconstruction and discussing the latest techniques method, and methods used in the industry. He will be covering topics such as data collection, analysis, and interpretation, and providing you with the tools and insights you need to gain a better understanding of this complex field. We are privileged to have Mr. Neal to, for today's webinar and look forward to hearing from him as he shares his expertise and insights. Feel free to um, write down any questions you have throughout and we'll be doing a Q&A after each section. Without uh, further ado, Mr. Neal. All right, thank you very much. Let's get it going here. All right. Welcome again. My name is Joseph Neal. I'm with Explico. And today we are going to discuss heavy vehicle collision investigation and reconstruction. First, a little bit about Explico. We are a firm uh, that covers many disciplines uh, across the country. We have offices in Detroit, Denver, Chicago, Tampa Bay, Salt Lake City, Seattle, and Los Angeles. Uh, but we also cover other states that are in our surrounding area uh, or even nationwide. Our specialties are biomechanics, uh, fire and explosion, human factors, railroad investigation, marine uh, accident investigation, and uh, as well as other things, but today we will be talking about traffic uh, accident reconstruction. As was mentioned earlier, um, I, we are gonna be focusing on uh, heavy vehicles, uh, but I do bicycle and passenger vehicle, motorcycle, single vehicle, uh, construction zones, and various other um, forms of investigation and reconstruction. So if you could, uh, since raising hands doesn't really work on the Zoom call, uh, who here currently works in um, cases that involve heavy trucks? If you could put a, a yes in the uh, chat box, that would be great. Or raise your hand. Um, so give us an idea of who's actively you know, working on these or who maybe is looking to work on these types of uh, uh, cases in the future. So the first thing that we want to talk about today is data gathering. 
Now, everybody knows to get the police report and try to get some police photographs or maybe some photographs of the vehicle that were taken by the parties involved. Um, but there's a lot of other data that really needs to get gathered before you know we can really get started and get things moving. And, and we want to try to capture it all. And the sooner that that investigation begins, the more likely we're going to be able to get things like surveillance video from surrounding businesses or even um, residential homes. More and more homes are having things like ring doorbells installed. And we have done work with ring doorbell videos uh, in the past. We want to make sure we get the maintenance records of vehicles. Um, the any dash cam that was involved from either subject vehicles, witness vehicles, or from the police vehicles who they may arrive after the scene, but they may capture something, um, especially in cases where you know the, the police don't necessarily get out the camera and start taking photographs. Those body camera uh, from the police or the, the dash camera from the police cars can be you know very helpful. We want to make sure that we gather the driver pre-trip, post-trip inspection forms. Um, those need to be kept for three months. Uh, and once an incident occurs, you want to get that data and, and get it um, stored so it doesn't get purged as, as time goes on. Uh, the big part of the driver's inspection is that you uh, are allowing the driver to, to find issues before the vehicle goes out onto the road. Um, another thing that we want to make sure we get is electronic driver logs. Uh, the electronic driver logs, they, they're a requirement now to be electronic as of uh, 2017. And we want that, that's going to show the times of service when the driver was driving, when the driver was down. And um, it, it, it's going to just kind of paint the entire picture of what the day and the days leading up to the incident for the driver was like. You want to make sure we get the you know annual inspections, um, it, the driver's training, any you know periodic safety meetings uh, if it's for a, a large carrier, and the you know regular maintenance records of the vehicle was the vehicle being kept and do they have uh, the records for that. Um, not every single thing is going to always appear on any repair records. For example, if it needs a new light, that might be something that, oh, they just have something sitting in the back, they put the new light in, take the old light out. But for the larger things, they're typically going to have some form of a record. Now, in the event of an incident, what we want to do is get out to that vehicle and get documenting and inspecting the various uh, components. So we want to look at the brakes. We want to document uh, everything that is um, important to validate any event data recorder that was stored on the engine. Um, and that means getting things like the engine serial number, the transmission data, the drive line, uh, axle to gear ratio. And, and these are just things that we want to make sure we have documented. So um, in, in, in the instance where we get a download from the subject vehicle, that we can validate if there is uh, an incident stored, whether or not that incident is reporting speeds correctly but also that it's from our subject incident. Another thing we want to would be very um, cautious about, well, I, I see this on DOT inspection reports from time to time, where they will cite a driver for something that may have actually happened during the incident. Oh, you have a light that is uh, out, uh, you get cited for that and they, say, no, this was not a uh, cause of the collision. Well, you can see uh, that picture on the right of the taillight is broken, and there's also a whole lot of glass around it as well. 
which is intuitive that that's an area of the vehicle that was involved directly in the collision process. So we're building that case that no, this was this was something that happened due to the impact, not uh, something that resulted in the impact occurring. Uh, similar, you know, things like the uh, you, you don't want the, to have you no know, answer for um, wrongly attributing damage. Um, that, that look, it just happens. The police, they're out there, they're doing the best job that they can with the time that they have. And we want to make sure that we have, you know, good, high quality photographs and analysis that show that no, that doesn't really jive, that doesn't really make sense with the facts of the case. Uh, we want to get to the vehicles, we want to document the damage, we want to get to the incident location as well. The uh, biggest eradicator of evidence is time. Tire marks fade, gouge marks even fade. Uh, roads get repaved, vehicles, well, they get lost uh, is a nice way to put it, but they end up not being available for inspection anymore. So the sooner we get to them, the better. Now, when we do get data, this is uh, an example uh, of a download from a Cummins engine. And what we have to think about is, okay, it has three sudden deceleration events. How do we tie that to our event? For which one of those three events were um, involved in the subject collision, if any? And that's one of the things that these inspections really help us be able to, you know, source out as to whether or not the uh, anything from the download was actually involved in our subject incident. And that's why the data interpretation is so important. Um, you know, it, it, it's the idea of trust but verify. You can see something uh, that is, is put into a report and it just says, oh, these are the speeds, these are the things that we determined. Well, how do we know if it's actually true or consistent with the subject incident? You know, for example, um, the reported speed from these vehicles, they're, they're all done based on the drive line of the truck. Uh, this isn't something from a GPS. This is uh, this is why that transmission and that drive axle data is so important. And you can see here, we go from 54 to 52 to zero. Nothing can, it doesn't stop that fast. And it didn't hit a, a, a you know, wall either. What happened was this vehicle does not, was not equipped with analog brakes. And therefore the, um, when, when the tires locked up, they stopped spinning. So the truck is reporting a speed of zero when even though those, the, the tires aren't showing any ground speed, that vehicle is still moving forward. Um, HVEDR or heavy vehicle event data recorders. This is the coverage summary uh, over the last 25 years. Um, vehicles uh, and manufacturers, they kind of come on board and come off board. So our first example on this list is Caterpillar. They don't make over the road engines or over the road trucks anymore, but these engines last so long what happens is uh, where the truck may have failed they, or, or is no longer usable, they take that engine out of that truck and put it in a different one. And then when we get to that vehicle, that, that, that post vehicle inspection, another thing that we're going to look at, and we're gonna have a case study today on, is the brakes and their operation and the they functional during that time. Um, so we're going to talk about an engineering inspection, which is like a DOT uh, inspection, but it goes a step further. We take additional measurements. Just because a brake may have been out of spec does not mean 
that it was a contributing factor to the incident. We'll discuss that a little bit more in case study two here. So uh, of our three case studies, our first one, we're gonna be discussing collision severity. Um, our second is why brake inspections matter. And our third one is some advanced reconstruction methods. So our, our first uh, case study, this came to me while I was actually at a convention. Um, I was uh, speaking with an attorney I hadn't met before, and he started talking to me as well. I, I have this case. It's a, it's a rear end impact at, at highway speeds. And uh, I just, I don't know what, if anything, we're going to be able to do with it. So yeah, I asked him a little more information. Uh, he told me it involved a, a 2017 Kenworth tractor and fully loaded trailer, a 2015 uh, Nissan Versa that happened on I-57 in Mount Vernon, Illinois, in broad daylight. These are... He brought me down uh, a couple of, of pictures. This is the rear end of the Versa after the incident. And if you peel back that bumper cover, you can see that there is damage beyond that plastic, but it, it's just at that top level of the bumper. Um, and then finally, you know, this was our Kenworth. Uh, and this is what it looked like at the scene after the incident occurred. So based on just those few pictures, I was able to walk him through a couple of the key points and what we would be able to do. So the first thing I noticed about this picture is there's no damage to that trunk lid whatsoever. There's no damage to the rear taillight assemblies. All that damage is located at the um, bumper level. And the damage that we are seeing, it, it looks more than it is because it's there's cracked plastic. That is just a big piece of plastic uh, around the rear end of that vehicle covering up those structural components. So I'm hearing, okay, we have this, this, this rear end collision at highway speeds. So we went to the site uh, after I was, you know, um, contracted for this and we had some provided photos. And another thing that jumps out at me right away is, well, the vehicles, they, they drove to a controlled stop. They drove, you know, there was no loss of control, spinning out, hitting other things and coming to rest somewhere. After the incident occurred, both vehicles were able to pull over to the right side of the roadway. Also, the site visit allowed us to, uh, to verify the speed limit. Now, the Nissan driver testified that she was traveling um, uh, five miles below, five miles an hour, uh, below the posted speed limit, which seems to happen quite a bit. Um, and uh, then based off of our analysis, we were able to determine that there is no evidence that the subject truck was traveling over the posted speed limit. So as we were talking and hearing more about the case and moving forward, um, we found out that the Nissan hadn't been repaired. It was still available for inspection. So we set up an inspection. And the first thing I did uh, when we arrived at the vehicle was downloaded the airbag control module. Now, there was no event stored on this vehicle's airbag control module. Since it's a 2015, that means it's part 563 compliant. And what that means is for the uh, vehicle to record an event, just any event, even if an airbag is employed, those are called non-deployment events, you have to have a five mile per hour Delta V over a 150 millisecond time frame. 
So the first thing we know is this vehicle, there's, there's no testimony to think that it wasn't on at the time of the incident. She said she was driving along the expressway. Uh, so the vehicle was on. So the only explanation for why there was no event stored on this is that it did not experience a delta V greater than five miles per hour over 150 millisecond time frame. Then during the inspection, I brought, uh, I had photos that were provided to, to me and that I would then recreate to just show, look, look, this thing hasn't been altered, repaired, or enhanced um, since the incident occurred. And we start looking at the uh, evidence on this subject vehicle, and it's, it's just not, it, it's not adding up with the idea that this is a highway speeds collision because that's technically true, but it's misleading in what uh, they actually mean by that. So we're analyzing all of this data uh, or, or the damage from the Nissan, and then we want to look at the uh, Kenworth. Now, this vehicle was no longer available for inspection, um, but we have photographs that show the damage on the front bumper. And we were able to look at an exemplar Kenworth. An exemplar means it's the same make, model, and year uh, as the subject vehicle, and, or year range, I should say. And what that means is uh, I could take a part off of the exemplar vehicle and attach it directly to our subject vehicle. The parts are interchangeable. So we start going through the process of documenting the area that was damaged um, from our subject truck. And now we start building at how did these vehicles come together? What parts of the vehicles contacted each other? What parts of the vehicles did not contact each other? And since that, that trunk lid was not damaged, we have a limit now for how much damage there could have been. And we know that because we were able to take direct measurements. We also got into that vehicle and looked at the components up underneath all that plastic. What do those structural components look like? Now, I'm based out of Michigan, so I had to fly in and I flew into St. Louis. And what I did was called around to all the airport rental agencies until I found a rental agency that had a large stock of Nissan Versus. And I drove that right to the inspection, parked it right next to the subject vehicle. And then I'm able to measure the subject vehicle against the exemplar vehicle. We look at all those different components that make up that rear bumper assembly, take measurements of them and show that, no, the damage really was limited to that small transfer mark that we saw earlier on that bumper, on that actual steel bumper bar. So then we were able to scan that subject vehicle, scan our exemplar vehicle, take all those measurements that we used, create 3D models of vehicles and put them together and line them up at impact. We take those point clouds, turn them into better looking models. And now all of a sudden you're starting to paint the picture of what is happening here. So while it's true that the collision did happen at highway speeds, the relative speed between the vehicles, what we call the closing speed, was minimal. We were able to calculate that the largest delta V that was experienced, that could have been experienced by the Nissan, was about three to four miles per hour. It was probably lower, but that is a conservative analysis. And we were then able to determine that, yeah, look, they came into contact, they may have been traveling 60 you know, miles per hour at the time, 
Um, but the relative speed between them was just a few miles per hour. And that's consistent with the Delta V that we saw. Okay, do we have any questions from our first? One real quick. So when you assess that there's the three to four miles per hour potential Delta V that um, may have occurred in this incident, I, I suppose, how can you take that then one step further and utilize it actually in your case when plaintiffs claiming so many injuries or what, um, how could you present that to a jury to, to say the injuries aren't relevant or aren't, you know, equal to the, the incident that actually occurred? Yes. Um, so I am a, uh, an, an accident reconstructionist. Um, when you have these types of delta Vs, these types of accelerations that are very low, um, I will bring in someone else uh, from our team who is a biomechanical uh, engineer, and they they talk about the injury causation, um, like things like was the mechanism of action that would have caused this injury present in the actual um, impact. So then what, what they'll do is take that, uh, if, it, if let's say the mechanism of action wasn't present, then you know they move on and just, hey, there was no mechanism to have caused that injury. Um, if there was a mechanism of action, then you start relating it to the uh, scientific literature as to um, whether or not it crossed any threshold that would have caused that type of injury. Uh, and oftentimes we will then um, relate it to, to accelerations and forces of activities that are consistent with uh, daily daily living. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. And, and there'll be more time for questions at the end. So if you want to go ahead and uh, if any questions come up, just type them in the chat and we will uh, get to them. All right, our second case study was a daytime uh, incident. A dump truck was traveling westbound. Mitsubishi was traveling northbound. The speed limit for the dump truck was 55 miles per hour. And, and the Mitsubishi had a stop sign. The dump truck did not. This is a uh, drone aerial image that I flew while I was at the inspection location uh, with the various trajectories of our vehicles um, leading up to the impact. So unfortunately, this was a, a fatal incident. So what that does mean is we had a lot of photographs that were taken of the subject incident location. And we can see the, the pre-impact and post-impact tire marks here. And we can see the final rest locations of the vehicles here. Uh, the dump truck rolled onto its side in a quarter turn rollover, and the Mitsubishi spun out and came to rest. Both vehicles came to their final rest location on the northwest corner of the intersection. Now, this is a view approaching our area uh, from the perspective of the Mitsubishi driver. And you can see once you get to the stop sign, you have a very uh, clear and long line of sight. There is a hill that we're contending with. Um, but when you come back and you look at it from the perspective of the dump truck driver, you have, again, there are some trees, but there's lots of gaps uh, in between the trees that show the, the, you know, that would show any vehicle or any vehicle traveling more than would be visible to the driver. Now, while we were at the scene, created a 3D scan of the incident location. And that's just taking millions of points uh, 
of the incident location, and then we were able to take a the the drone aerial image that I also produced and create a full 3D map of that incident location. The other thing that it allowed us to do, we have all these tire marks in the roadway. We have final rest locations. We have an impact uh, mark when designating the uh, point of impact. Well, by the time I got there, time had taken its toll and the tire marks, the furrow marks, the final rest locations, they, they had all washed away uh, over time. But through the process of photogrammetry, we were able to map out all those tire marks. We were able to map out all of the, um, fight there to map out the final rest locations of the subject incident. Uh, or of the vehicles in the subject incident. And we were able to take all of that data, lay it out over an aerial, and now we know where the tire marks began, impact occurred, and where the final rest locations of the vehicles are. So the big prospect, the big point of this case uh, were two things. Did the Mitsubishi driver stop prior to entering the intersection? And uh, was the brakes, which were technically out of service, did they or were they a contributing factor to the incident? Well, to do that, we've got to continue to gather that evidence. And the Mitsubishi, again, was, was no longer available for inspection. Um, the police had tried to download the airbag control module and there were, uh, there were some issues, I can't remember if it was damaged uh, in the process, but it even got shipped off to the manufacturer and they still weren't able to, to download that airbag control module. So the nice thing that we do have is all of the photographs. So using a, a similar process and where we laid out all of that, excuse me, all of the, um, evidence from the roadway, we were able to take an exemplar. Again, that means it's the same make, model, and year range of our uh, subject vehicle and do the process of photogrammetry so we knew where the vehicle's components would have been prior to an impact and then where they were after the impact occurred. And we were able to map out all of that damage on that vehicle, map out the match points, the specific points on this vehicle that came from the, the dump truck and map the crush of the subject Mitsubishi. As you can see, there's quite a bit of intrusion on this vehicle. Uh, unfortunately, it was the people in the passenger side, front and rear seats that did not fare well in this particular incident. Now, this was an older, this was an older dump truck, but these things, they last a very long time. It's also very difficult to find the exemplars of this, but we have a solution for that. As you can see here, we created a scan of the, the 3D scan of the subject vehicle that maps out all of its damage, but those components are no longer in the same location. And that's why it was very nice that the company owned a second Kenworth or, uh, uh, dump truck, okay? And same year range, same model, uh, same components. And we were able to scan that vehicle as well to be able to model, model the vehicle before and after the impact. Now, these trucks are notoriously difficult to get the weight of because when, it, when, when someone buys a dump truck, what has happened is a third party company has bought a truck with nothing on it and put the dump mechanism on the back of it. 
So we took the exemplar to a uh, certified scale, weighed the entire truck, and weighed the front and the axles. So we now not only do we know the full weight um, of the vehicle, but we know the weight distribution as well, which is important for our brake force calculations. Now that we have the uh, damage mapped out on the vehicles, we're able to put them together at impact. Where we put them together at impact, we know the crush of the vehicle, we know the post impact trajectories, we know the final rest locations. So we were able to determine the speeds. Coming back to our site, this right here, we have tire marks, but this particular area, that is indicative of the impact location. That is from the right rear wheel of that Mitsubishi, that as it got hit, it got pushed down into the ground and left that great big long mark. So we know the impact speeds of both vehicles. One of the things we're able to determine is there is no way that the Mitsubishi could have stopped at the stop sign and accelerated up to that speed to the, where the impact occurred. So we know the Mitsubishi didn't stop at impact or, or at the stop bar prior to impact. Then the question became, well, the police did um, a D, uh, an inspection of the brakes. Excuse me. The police did an inspection of the brakes and they found um, an out of service criteria where the truck should have been taken out of service and put uh, repaired before being put back on the road. So we looked at all the braking components that uh, were on the truck at the time of the incident. We measured things, we document what types of chambers there are. This is a single chamber on a steer axle. This is a dual chamber, which means it acts as not only a service brake, but also the parking slash emergency brake. And we found that um, the, a couple of the brakes were technically uh, out of spec, but these have built into them what's called a safety factor. So when you reach the defect limit, it still has braking power past it. So by documenting everything, by measuring the radius of the drum, by measuring the thickness of the brake liners, by measuring the size of um, and the types of the cans that were used for the brakes, we were able to determine that no, it had full braking efficiency, even though it was technically out of spec. It's, you're not gonna find that every time. Sometimes you, you'll find that they, the brakes have gone so far out of spec that they do lose braking efficiency. But you don't want to be on the side of someone else making the claim that, hey, this is this this truck um, had those brakes, you know, been repaired uh, or maintained, well, then uh, it wouldn't have, uh, the incident wouldn't have occurred. Now, one thing to go back to before we move on to our next case study to think about with, with all of this that was done, we have tire marks leading up to the point of impact. And they were still making the claim that no, 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 these brakes, they were defective. Had they been operational, then the incident wouldn't have occurred. All right, do we have any more questions before we move on? Oh. Looks like we've got one. Uh, oh, maybe two. Okay, hold on. Let's see. Um, how could you establish that the brakes on the dump truck were in the condition you found them post accident as they were before the accident? So that's a, that is a very good question. In this case, the subject dump truck 
was um, put out of service. It, that, 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 that truck will never drive again. Um, so the, the, the brakes wouldn't have worn more over time. Um, they're just sitting there at this point. So anything, nothing's going to change with their, their um, shape and, and dimension. Now, if the question is then, well, how do you know that the owner didn't make changes? Well, that's why you document, uh, you document this very, very well. If, if you're gonna start taking off components to try to hide that you're putting new components on, we would have found something like that. You, you can tell when there is a brand new brake liner put on a truck, uh, these things get extremely dirty and they need to be cleaned heavily before they can be worked on. So that's a, that's a big component here that, um, that you know, you document everything in the condition that you found it in. It, it's not like it might get dirtier over time, but you're not gonna get the grease caked on it from just sitting there in, in a field like that. And the next question is, how do you consider driver reaction time and if they were focused on the road. Yeah, so that is a very, that, that's a uh, great question because a big uh, part of this case was the perception response time of the driver of, uh, of the dump truck. Now, the problem with the Mitsubishi that we have is we don't know what it was doing prior to the impact, we just know its impact speed. So uh, it was traveling about 35 miles an hour at the time of the impact. Um, so we don't know if it was braking though down to 35, was traveling 50 and brake, or if it had slowed to 35 and then was going at a constant speed, or if it had slowed down to 30 and now was accelerating up. So we analyze those different scenarios, okay, at a constant speed, where would the Mitsubishi have been? Uh, if it were braking, where would it have been? If it were accelerating, where would it have been? And what we were able to find is not only did our truck driver respond, but he responded very well uh, in terms of we know where the, where the truck was, we know where it began to break, we know where his, um, you know, based on research and studies uh, where the, you know, 98 percentile driver would, would take their foot from the gas pedal to the brake. And uh, we determined that he had an exceptionally good perception response time um, for the subject incident. And that's consistent with his testimony that he stated, oh, I saw the vehicle coming, it never stopped when, uh, when it was at the, the stop bar. Um, but not only that, he said something along the lines of, I didn't think it was going to stop. So I, I started my, um, my, my braking process. So he had an exceptionally good perception response time. That, that's difficult on these large you know, country roads with um, high, you know, relatively high speed limits um, to, to determine those types of things when you're a driver. So yeah, that driver did an exceptionally good job. All right. Now, our third case study. We are going to determine the impact speeds from video. This incident happened on an overpass here in Michigan in November. And as anyone who's lived in Michigan through a winter um, knows, bridges ice before roads. That's because the thermal mass of the uh, ground keeps the, the roadway warmer, longer, so ice doesn't form. But once you get on that bridge, there isn't all that thermal mass keeping it warm, so they tend to freeze. Now, we have uh, a tractor trailer that crossed the center of the median and contacts a viewing. Um, now, this, this picture, this is one of these uh, pictures that when, when you get to it, 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 it always reminds me of like uh, one of those bat plot devices in movies where you hear the record scratch and it's like, I bet you're wondering how I ended up like this. 
Well, that's what we're here to determine. This is our truck after the impact at its final rest location. As you can see on the other side, uh, we have another vehicle that was involved that's in quite rough shape. Uh, unfortunately, the driver did not survive uh, this impact, uh, the driver of the Buick. Our truck, the whole front axle uh, was, was torn from the vehicle due to this incident and our Buick burst into flames. So this is a top-down view of our uh, overpass, our tractor trailers traveling westbound. We have a Buick that's traveling eastbound, and then we have a third witness vehicle that had a dash camera in it also traveling eastbound. Now, the first thing you think, okay, let's go to the Buick and let's get that airbag control module. When a modern vehicle catches on fire, just when, when you get in your vehicle the next time, look around at all the plastic. That means that all that plastic is not only flammable, but if it doesn't catch fire, what does it do? It melts. Now, the inspection, the initial inspection of this vehicle was done without Explico present. And with all of that plastic that melted down onto the floor, right over top of where that airbag control module was located. So they had to come in with a saw to try to cut it out. And during the process, of trying to cut it out, cut into the airbag control module. And that blade went right through that plastic casing. Not all of them are plastic, some of them are metal, but this one went right through that plastic casing, right into the circuit board and right into the chip that stored the data. So we have no pre-impact speed from an airbag uh, control module data. But we do have footage. This is the witness vehicle traveling eastbound in the right-hand lane. And on the, from the left side, there's our Buick. And now you're gonna see the truck came over and contacted that viewing. Now, the first thing we have to do when we get footage like this, and you can really see uh, here why this is important, we have to correct for lens distortion. These lenses, they're set up to be wide angle, to, to, to take in as much area as possible. Well, we want to correct that so we end up with straight lines. And you can really see that on the hood here. And the image on the left, the hood is kind of flat or maybe even uh, concave a little bit, where the image on the right, where we've corrected for that um, lens distortion, the hood looks like you would expect a hood to look like that, that rounded shape in the front. So now that we've corrected for the lens distortion, we're getting a much what we call flatter image. It is much more reflective of um, the, you know, the dimensions and the shapes of the things uh, uh, involved in this incident. Now, if we go out to the site and the whole goal here is we want to determine the speed of the Buick. Since that airbag control module information is gone, we need to come up with a new way uh, or a different way to determine that speed. And what's so difficult about heavy vehicles, commercial vehicles, tractor trailers, dump trucks, they weigh so much more than passenger vehicles. Orders of magnitude. So 
we go out to the site, we scan the site, we are now creating control points for where the witness vehicle is during this process. And then we're able to come through, we know the relative speed of this witness vehicle on the roadway. And now we can track the speed of the Buick as it comes through the image. Now, once we come back, we've corrected the lens distortion, determined the speed of the witness vehicle, and we have now determined the speed of the Buick. And this area had a speed limit of 45 miles per hour. And what we were able to determine from this is that that Buick was traveling 55 to 60. That wouldn't have been able to have been done uh, necessarily with traditional methods because it's just such a, a, uh, a non-typical type of collision. The other uh, important thing here is look, an incident may have still occurred, but those vehicles wouldn't have came together the way they had, had the Buick been traveling the posted speed limit. That means the Buick was, would have been much less likely to have caught fire, which is what was so devastating about this collision. Now, we have a bonus. We have a second dash cam from the truck itself. We've corrected for the lens distortion. This one looks a little different because it's a different type of camera. Every camera has its own lens distortion correction. But you can see here's where it begins to lose control. Here's where it comes across. And here's where the collision occurs. And we are able to go through and take the same process uh, and map out the not only the speed of this truck, but we can also track the oncoming Buick as well. And what we found is good agreement from both video analyses of what the speed of that Buick was doing prior to impact. And here is what our, our final product looks like after we have kind of matched that up. The, the truck was traveling well below the posted speed limit. It came from a stop on the other side of the overpass. So we had no speed issues with the truck, just the, the loss of control. Okay. Uh, do we have any more questions on this or any other part of the presentation? All right, just to remind everyone, uh, we do have locations across the country. We have our various uh, specialties. The QR code that you see on the right uh, that is for a, a survey uh, on the presentation, and you have my contact information below. Uh, you can always reach out to me or anyone else at Expoco. Uh, if you have questions on a particular um, case that you have, and um, we can take a look at it and, and see what we have to offer. that up for another second and I'll, I'll stick around for another minute uh, in case we have any more questions that come up and look uh, you have my contact information if uh, you have a specific question of something we discussed today or something that we didn't discuss today feel free to reach out to me you can send me an email you can give me a call um, it's really up to you mm -hmm. Someone wants to know if uh, you are on LinkedIn. 
I yes, I am on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I you would you would search for me as uh, Joseph Neal. I, I you can call me Joe or Joseph. None of it bothers me. I don't I don't have a preferred uh, thing to be called. It, it's I go by Joseph professionally um, because when I answer the phone, hello, this is Joe Neal. People think that's my first name. They, they think my name is Joe Neal. Um, and they will ask me what my last name is. So you can look me up on LinkedIn, uh, at Joseph Neal, and obviously I work for uh, Explico. Please feel free to, uh, to I'd, I'd love to connect with uh, anyone and everyone who, who joined us today. Joe, we really appreciate it. It was my pleasure. Uh, you know, another thing, if it, um, you have uh, colleagues that were unable to make it today, um, but you think that they would be interested in learning more, uh, I do come out to individual law firms uh, and give these types of presentations as well. It doesn't have to be an exact repeat of this. I will customize it to whatever your needs are. Thank you, Joseph. Right. Well, thank you very much for everyone's time. If you had anybody else that didn't see this, this will also be available for uh, review on the MDTC's YouTube channel. So make sure to go check that out if you uh, wanted to rewatch any part of this.